worship today by singing, open the eyes of my heart. Lord, I'm here today because I want to see you. See him high and lifted up. That's who our God is that we've come to worship today. Let's stand and sing, open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart.
Well, good morning. It's so uh, great to be here to be able to worship together uh, as God's people. I want to extend a special welcome to our guests this morning. I want to just remind y'all, I know that it should be in your bulletin and you, you see these announcements just to highlight a couple of things, though. Uh, March 4th, I believe that is March 4th. It's the first Sunday in March. I know that we're going to have our FBCW Foundations class. So if you are not a member, uh, if you're just interested in learning more about membership or you feel like, yes, this is where God wants us, but you haven't been a part of that FBCW Foundations class, it's one hour on a Sunday night. Let me encourage you to come. It's a time, it's a relaxed time. I'm just going to share some things about uh, the ministry here and church membership, talk about a few key doctrinal things and let you get our statement of faith, some other documents. But I want you to try to be here if you haven't been a part of that FBCW Foundations class. That's coming up on the first Sunday night in March at six o'clock and it'll be upstairs. And I think it's room 214, but don't quote me on that. It should be, should be in your bulletin there. Uh, also, just want to uh, encourage you to come back tonight if you haven't been a part of the ladies' Bible study or the Roman study in here for uh, men and ladies. You're, you're welcome to come in here uh, for that on Sunday night tonight. We'll be in here again in Romans. Uh, also, just praise God, the children's ministry upstairs with our team kid on Sunday nights is just going so strongly. We're so thankful to God for that, for the volunteers. We actually had one of our newest members, couples, that has uh, volunteered already and is up there teaching. And so we're just excited to see how God is plugging people in to the life of the church here. We, we want to go to the Lord in prayer for several things. Obviously, this has caught our attention as a nation to see the, the shooting in Broward County. It seems like every time we turn around, another one of these things is happening in our schools. And we just, we can't fully understand it. We know that it, it, it breaks our hearts. It breaks uh, Jesus's heart. And uh, we just have to Go and pray and lift this before the Lord. Uh, we want to see God come and, and take something that is not good, that's evil, but bring good out of this. And so that should be our prayer, and that Christians would rush in and be there to be salt and light and care for those that are hurting right now. But let's, let's pray about that, and let's pray for this morning. Father, thank you that uh, you are a God who cares. You are a God who did not leave us in our sin, our lost state, but made a way for us by sending your perfect, holy, righteous son to die on the cross for our sin. Father, our hearts do go out to the family members and the loved ones of those that have been impacted so greatly by the shooting in Broward County, Southeast Florida, others across the land. We we heard about just another a shooting in, in Russia this morning in a church. And so, Father, every time we turn around, it seems we're getting this message of the evil in our world. It seems like it's out of control, and yet we know that you're in total control. Here we come and just lay before you. We can't understand all the human suffering that's going on, but we know you're a God that cares. We know that you're a God that wants to come and comfort and heal. And so that's our prayer this morning for those that are hurting May you mobilize your church to come and to meet needs and be there and share the gospel, the greatest need that anybody could ever have, to know the love of God in Christ Jesus. Father, this morning, help us to direct our thoughts and attention to you and you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing a great hymn of the faith, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Let's stand. Yeah. 
Take a moment to greet each other as we welcome the uh, Joe Thor Show. This is Pastor Sam Roach. I'm glad you've joined us for the live stream of this morning's worship service. But if you live in the Charlotte area, I invite you to join us in person next Sunday right here at 348 Providence Road South in Weddington. Our Sunday school or small groups are for all ages and meet at 9.30 a.m., followed directly by our worship service at 1045. As you will see from the live stream of the service this morning, our Sunday morning services are a time that we gather as a community of believers for focused worship of God. Our service includes a time of singing hymns and praise songs, prayer, reading of scripture, giving of our tithes and offerings, and a sermon from the scripture. I look forward to seeing you this Sunday or in the near future. Until then, may God richly bless you. Just remain standing as we sing this next song. This song says that the power of the blood of Jesus is strong enough to break every chain, to break every stronghold in our lives, that there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. to break. 
army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up to break every chain, 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 to break every chain. speck called earth. It's so humbling to look at the vastness of all that you've created and on earth you created this beautiful country so that we are free to worship you. And we just give you all the glory and thank you for all the blessings you give us this great country, all the leaders that we have especially in this church. And thank you for the opportunity to give a small portion of that back to the furtherment of your kingdom. We pray all of this in your precious name. Amen.
to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. We're in Luke 12 today. We're going to begin in verse 13. Just to set this in context, remember last week we said that Luke records Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. In fact, these are, last week was the first of three times that Luke mentions that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where he'll be crucified, rise three days later. And this is, we're in the middle of that first section where Luke talks about Jesus setting his face. He was resolved to go to Jerusalem. And at this point in time, it's Jesus with his disciples and a large crowd. So tons of people around Jesus at this time. He's had some encounters with the Pharisees. And then beginning in verse 13, we pick up with what Luke tells us about someone in the crowd that's going to say something to Christ. Verse 13, Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. An English college professor told this story to her classmate. She said that she grew up in the uh, Midwest, a small Midwestern town. It was during the time of the Depression, but her father, through good decisions, working very hard, he became a banker and he did very well, became very well off. She and her five sisters growing up in this house uh, made some uh, different choices. The, uh, The five sisters stayed at home and the English professor decided that she was going to go off somewhere and go to university. Her sister stayed home, went to school, but she went off to a university in another uh, place in the country. She ended up uh, going out to the West Coast. Uh, She married. She had a a career out there with her husband as well. And years later, her father passed away. And so she and her husband, they, they hurried back to, their, to her hometown, and, and, and they, they get back to her home where she grew up, and her, her mother is there, and, and she and her husband start looking around. They, they greet her mother, greet her sisters. They look around. They see every single item in the household has been tagged with a name of one of her sisters on it. So it's Margaret, Anne, Deborah. Every, everything in the house was tagged. And so that night, they sit down for a dinner, and there was supposedly this kind of acrimonious silence there. It, it, was, it was very odd. Uh, just no one was really saying much. But at one point, this, uh, this lady's husband, that had, they had come, she had come home, he stands up, gets out of his chair, goes over behind her poor mother, and he says, says everyone has tagged something in this house that, that they want. They've placed their tag on what they want. He said, then he put his hands on her shoulders, the mother's shoulders, and said, we're placing our tag on what we want. You know, greed can be a very ugly thing. It is an ugly thing. Leon Morris said, greed can never get enough. Worry is afraid it may not have enough. Now, in this passage today, Jesus is going to make this connection between this sin of covetousness, the sin of greed, and worry. And the message for us is about the gospel and how God wants us to incorporate the gospel into our daily lives so that we can find freedom from anxious living. The gospel offers freedom from anxious living, and that's what we're going to see in our text today. In verses 13 through 21, here's the, here's the exhortation we're going to read Uh, Jesus' very words, here's the exhortation to us, be on our guard against greed. So this one person in the crowd shouts out to Jesus about telling telling Jesus to to make a decision about how the inheritance should be divided up between him and his brother. There were Old Testament laws on inheritance and how that should happen. Basically, you look at Jesus' response to him and he's not very pleased it's, it's not just that Jesus is saying, look, I'm not, I haven't come here to worry about these details and get involved in your life. I've come here to proclaim the kingdom of God. That's tr-. But he sees something in this man that indicates he's being very greedy. And so we pick up after Jesus 
response to him, we pick up, and Jesus is going to turn to his disciples. So the crowd was in earshot of what Jesus said, most likely. Now, and, he, and this was for them, now he's going to turn to his disciples. Verse 6 it says, And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Now, so far, so good. <laughs> what do we have here? We have somebody that's rich at the beginning of this parable. Note that. Even if it didn't tell us he was a rich man, the fact that he's a landowner lets us know, and this is rich. And he has this bumper crop. And so what does he do? He thinks about, what should I do? That's a good thing. God's blessed us. We get increase. We should think about, what should I do with this? Here's where he gets in trouble, verse 18. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. Verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays for himself and is not rich toward God. And so what happens in this parable that Jesus teaches, this bumper crop comes in, this rich man in the parable, he starts thinking about what should I do? And his, that's okay, we should do that. That's, a, that's not a bad thing. We should be uh, careful in how we take care of material possessions. But then thinking about, well, how can I do something for the kingdom of God? How can I do something to help my fellow man? No, he says, I don't have room for all of this abundance in my barn, so I'll just tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Greed. So greedy, doesn't think about God. The thought of God never comes into his mind. In fact, it's all of you. Look at this passage. It's my, I, I, first person, me, verse 19. And, and, and what is he doing? This is the only time in the Bible where it speaks of retirement, and it doesn't paint retirement in a very good light. Some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, I'm retired. We never retire from serving God. There's never a retirement from that. And Ecclesiastes, other places in the Bible, they hold up the blessings of food and drink and joy and merriment in its proper context. What we have here is someone that's focused on self. It seems to be a hedonistic, hedonistic approach to life. That's not good. He wants to just focus on me and my pleasures, and that's what I'm going to do with the rest of my days here. Well, guess what? Judgment comes. Verse 20 but God said to him, he calls him a fool, parable of the rich fool. There is going to be an accounting for every one of us, every one of us. Those of us who are in Christ, we don't face a judgment. We face a judgment of rewards, but we don't want to be ashamed. We don't want to be bad stewards of what God's entrusted to us. And so there's a principle there that we understand that one of these days we're going to stand before Christ. We're going to have to give an account for all that's been given to us. But this is a lost person. This person does not know God. This is not your soul is required of you. He's, he's going to perdition. He's going to be separated from God for eternity. And then and what about those things that he stored up? We shouldn't try to think about, well, what about his wife and what about his children? The point here basically is that everything that he thought he had is gone. It's all wasted. All that he thought he was saving, that's gone. As well. His very soul is lost. Here's, here's the point of the parable in verse 21. This is what's going to happen for everyone who lays up treasure for themselves and is not rich toward God. This, this individual was not rich towards God. He didn't think about God. The thought of God never entered his mind. 6.10, that's a verse that many of us are familiar with. For the love of money, not money, but for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. That uh, verb there, pierced, is parapero. It is completely pierced through completely. And then the noun there for pangs that's translated pangs in the ESV could also be translated pain, woe, distress. It's used in the Bible and other places to talk about the pain of childbirth. The, the rich man, greedy, covetousness. But you know, the Bible also, those that are rich and the poor too, who are very rich toward God. Think about what we've already seen in the book of Luke. We've already seen uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' home. That'll take more, uh, takes more of a center stage in John's gospel, but we, we know that uh, Mary and Martha have already been very hospitable to Jesus. They've helped him. And you think of the centurion that built the synagogue. 
uh, this centurion that, that gave of his wealth to, to do something that he viewed as part of the kingdom of God. And then we also saw in Luke about those several godly women that, that supported Jesus financially, these very well-off ladies that did that. And the Bible never discredits wealth. If you're wealthy, somehow you're sinful. Abraham was one of the most sinful people in the Old Testament, just for example. That's just one person. But what, what can we learn from this? If you think about that verse in 1 Timothy, and you think about our Heavenly Father being our Creator, we've already sung about that already, He knows what is best. Not only, notice that the parable doesn't get into all the people that, that He, it doesn't focus on what this, this man could have done in terms of all the people He could have helped. That's not the emphasis of the parable. The emphasis of the parable really is on what happens to Him. We should care. We should have a heart for other people. But if you think about this in the context that God is the one who created and He knows us inside and out. And if we live greedy and covetous lives, and, and that word in the ESV that's translated covetousness, it's also, it can be translated greedy as well, or greed. We shouldn't want to live that way. We think we should want to live that way, that we should just want, want more and happiness, but that's not the way God has designed Things. What about just some practical applications about being on guard against greed? You know, material uh, possessions can be a blessing if used properly. But one of the things that, that we could do as maybe just a test to see, you know, where, where, how am I doing on this question about guarding into the year when we get our financial statements? Can you, can you look at your income and then can you see a, a correlation between how much God has given you and then how much you have given to kingdom work? Is it 10%? You know, here at, the, at First Baptist Church of Weddington, we tell our new members, we, we expect you to tithe. Yes, I understand uh, it, it's an Old Testament principle, but it is an Old Testament principle. It's a principle that the Bible honors. It, it's clear in the New Testament that, that we, should, we should be cheerful givers and that as God blesses us, we should give of our increase. And so that's a very kind of, you know, if we like numbers, am, am I giving more than, is it 11, 12? Two, three percent. By the way, I I have no idea what people give here. It's a good thing to not know. I don't want to know. Unless you come and tell me that, hey, I want to give this to a certain certain amount of money, whatever. Unless you tell me, I don't know. But I do know this. In being in ministry, really the people with the most that give the most. Sometimes it's those that have uh, not very much by comparative standards of others in the kingdom of God, in the church, that give out of their abundance. Um, we, we need to give proportionally. We need to give as God has blessed us. The pet, those verses are very much, as I said earlier, connected with this idea of worry. And they're connected with the following verses. It, it's going to encourage us to live with the kingdom mindset as we get into this question of anxiety and worry. Let's read on verses 21 through 31. I'm going to break these down into several sections. And so 22 and 23. Here's Jesus. Uh, he's, he's, he's turning to his disciples. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on, for life is more than food and the body. This is this command, do not be anxious. Jesus has given this exhortation, command, don't worry, do not be anxious. This is kind of the summary statement for what is going to follow in these verses. First, don't worry about food. Don't worry about food. Consider the ravens, Jesus says, they neither sow nor reap, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Jesus is taking an example from everyday life. These, these ravens, these blackbirds, they are, they are found in every country in the world. They're not considered necessarily the most desirable bird, the most beautiful birds necessarily. You probably, some of you out there are getting upset. You love ravens. You love blackbirds. Not that we shouldn't work. You see other places in the Bible where animals are used as examples of hard work. Here is this point that he's making that, look, they don't plan uh, he, he's making an argument from the, the lesser to the greater. They, they don't plan. God takes care of that. How much more important are you? How much more valuable? And they don't worry. Why should you worry? As far as we know, they, they, they don't have that capacity. God takes care of them. So we shouldn't worry about food. We shouldn't worry about clothing. Verses 27 and 28. Uh, well, 26 is actually uh, connected to that last part. If 
then you're not able to do the small thing as that. What are you anxious about the rest? He's saying, look, you can't even do just the simple thing about adding just an hour to your life. How much, you know, why are you worried about where your food's going to come from? You're not able to do something that simple. Why do you think that you are going to be able to provide for yourself? It's God that does it. Verse, um, verse 27, and don't worry about clothing. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? These, these plants in Palestine, these tiny plants, they, were, they, they are, they're arrayed beautifully. God has, has created them with such beautiful colors. And Jesus is pointing to them. He's also saying, look, uh, Solomon wasn't dressed in such uh, splendor compared to these plants. And when you think of Solomon, you think of splendor. He's kind of loved, but just in the way he lived. If you look at his kings, when you think of King Solomon, you think of splendor. And Jesus is saying, look, th- this... These, this grass, even, it's used for fuel. It's thrown into the fire. God can take care of them. He can take care of you. Why are you worried about your clothes? And then he gives 29 through 31. A don't and a do. Verse 29, and do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. He's saying, don't do this. Don't seek, don't make this the focus of your life. What are material possessions? Don't, don't make that the, the centerpiece of what you're about. That's what, the, that's what people that don't know God do. That's how they live. Don't live like that. Here's the do, verse 31. Instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Seek his kingdom added to you. When we think of the kingdom... And we think of seek, seeking the kingdom, as the Zondervan Bible study says, to, to seek the kingdom is to seek Jesus. Because Jesus' ministry embodies the presence of the kingdom. And, and how do we seek Jesus? We, we want to learn. We want to do as he said to do. We want to follow his example. We want to make other disciples. That, that's how we seek Jesus. Are you a disciple-making disciple? Are you seeking the kingdom of God that way? Can you look at your life and say, yes, you know, God is using me because I'm making disciples. I'm giving what and I'm using it for kingdom purposes. Zondervan Study Bible also says there where it it talks about uh, worries. It says our worries reveal the object of our worship. Our worries reveal the object of our worship. And those that are seeking, seeking the kingdom of God, we have about material things. It doesn't say that we're not supposed to take account, that we're not supposed to plan, that we're not supposed to work hard. It doesn't say that, that we're not supposed to possess anything. It says we're not supposed to worry. Uh, it says in, in Psalm chapter 8, verse 4, David, in awesome prayer to God, at, at verse 4, he's talking about the creation and God's care for it. And then he thinks about man. He says, he says what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him. David is just lost in the wonder of God. He says, the substitute for the wonder of God is idolatry. We, We should just be in wonder as we've sung this morning about how God cares for his creation. He's created it. He cares for it. How he cares for you, how he cares for me, we should be in wonder of God because of that. Abraham Lincoln tells a story. Uh, he, he was actually on his way to uh, his inauguration in Washington, D.C., and he stopped in New York to talk with Horace Greeley to spend some time there. And Horace Greeley was asking this question that other people were asking, is there going to be a civil war? And, and bold Greeley, this, this anecdote basically to explain his answer to it. Lincoln said that you know, recently he had been traveling through the countryside. He was with some of his companions, and it was actually some time back from this conversation. In his circuit riding days, when Lincoln had to go from town to town to Gushens, there was one particular time when they were traveling along, and the, the rivers were swollen. The smaller rivers were swollen, the creeks were. And they were thinking about, oh, we, 
we're, we're encountering this. What's going to happen when we come to the Fox River? This was a much larger river, and so they're, they're concerned about this. They're worried, and they stay the night in this little hotel or tavern or somewhat, uh, some, th- some type of place like that, and they actually meet up with this Methodist circuit rider, this Methodist pastor circuit rider who uh, he had his own little circuit, and he, they started talking to him about the Fox River. They wanted to know what he thought about it, what this is going to be like. And the Methodist circuit rider said, oh, oh yeah. I said, I know, I know about the, uh, the Fox River. He said, I'm, I'm extremely familiar with it. I know, I know about it. I've been across it many times. He says, I have one fixed rule when it comes to the Fox River. I never... I never cross it till I reach it. He's just echoing something that we, we read in the Bible about, about worrying. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. It says in the parallel passage in Matthew of, of this passage, Matthew 6, 34, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. But worry can just rip us apart. We're worried about so many things. Soren Kierkegaard, he was a philosopher in the, I think, late 18th century, early 19th century, Kierkegaard, he, uh, he talked about this. He said, no as in readiness has in readiness such terrible torture as anxiety. No grand inquisitor has in readiness such terrible torture as anxiety. We had our diamond set meeting the ministry, I, Alicia and I love being a part of that. It's one of the just most fun groups to be around. And uh, Frank and Joni and us have been doing it for years. We, we had it last week, and uh, we had several of people over at our home. And this, this was the focus of the time was to hear from one of our church members about her life. She has an amazing testimony. And she wanted to share and, and bring an encouragement and let people know what God has done in her life. And she, she tells us several times in my life like you have had, but I just want to share about a couple of them. And, and she is an amazing person, just an incredibly successful career. She was the first person in Charlotte, first Charlotte resident that was hired by Apple Computers. And, and that's, a, that's a great testimony. And she was very successful in her career, traveled around. Uh, she spoke at a lot of the same events with Steve Jobs and did a lot of different things working alongside with Steve Jobs. And those were some great stories to hear about. But she shares about a personal experience. When she was in her early 50s, she was giving, uh, she was exhibition, and she was, she was talking to vendors on stage in front of thousands of people and everything went dark. In her early 50s, she lost her eyesight. And if you, you know who I'm talking about, uh, she doesn't consider that a disability, her inability, her lack of physical sight. She doesn't visual people ever. Here's what she shared with us. I'm going to share with you. She says that she wakes up every morning and she says this. She prays this. Lord Jesus, how would you have me serve you today? How would you have me to serve you today? See, Jesus is our king, and we are his subject. He, he is the Lord. We are the servant. He is the master. We are the slave. However you want to say it, uh, that's a mindset. That's a kingdom mindset. If we're not going to worry, if we're going to, that's the place where we need to start, having a kingdom mindset, understanding that we're called to serve Christ daily, and not looking ahead to what could happen but thinking about how can I serve you today? Lord Jesus, how would you have me to serve you today? This master that we have, this king that we serve, he's a loving master. He is a sacrificial king. You know, the father looked down at us in our helpless state and in covenant with the son and with the spirit said, you life, you die on the cross make a way for these people to have relationship with me. People that I care about, I, I love the world, and I want to send you to show that love to the world. And Jesus is this kind of king that went willingly. He went willingly. And so it's so key that we know that we know the key to all of this, that is to know our heavenly Father's heart, to know our heavenly Father's heart. Verses 
32 through 34. Verse 32, we, get, we just need to know God's heart. If you, if you just want to star a verse in all of this passage, star verse 32, Father, good pleasure, give the kingdom. <laughs> Fear not. Don't be anxious. Don't be fearful. Little flock, this caring concern, this idea, this, this flock that's being cared for by the heavenly Father, by our heavenly Father. It is your Father's eudakia. It's your Father's good already happened. He's already given us the kingdom. It says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, uh, for he, uh, He's delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption. He's already given us the kingdom of sins. If we know Christ, if we've been redeemed, we, we're, we're part of the kingdom. We're in the kingdom. Yes, there's that future kingdom as well where it's going to be visible, where Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom. And what's going to happen with the saints? They're going to rule with him. But it's because of their things. Kingdom. God has given you the kingdom. So we need to know God's heart. And it's not like he's done, done it begrudgingly. It's been his good pleasure to do that for us. Once rebels redeemed by his son, his shed blood on the cross. By the way, if you're listening and the kingdom bless you, you don't have a relationship with God through Christ, it, it, it's not going to matter. It doesn't make sense. You know, there, there is coming a day of judgment. But God, it says in John 3, 16 uh, and 17, that God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through the truth of the gospel that everyone has sinned. You've sinned. We've all sinned. We've all violated God's holy law. And face that truth. Face that truth and then turn from your sin in humility. Repent. Turn from it and receive the new birth. That you sin by faith in Christ and receive that free gift of salvation. It's not by works. It's not by anything you can do. It's only by what Jesus did on the cross going in your place. Will you make that decision right now? Do it. Don't wait. Don't wait. So we need to know God's heart, but then we need to, we need to focus on sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Remember in Luke, he, more than any of the other gospel writers, he's concerned about why is that? We don't know what is because his gospel, have this problem with greed, have this problem with covetousness more than the other gospel writers. We don't know that. But also remember Jesus in his sermon on the level. We, we noted that there. We'll note it here. A lot of times Jesus uses hyperbole to make a point. He states literally, remember what he said a few weeks ago, what would happen if, if all of the, the, the Christians were to sell all that they have and, and, ride, and every single one of us were to do that, you would have two classes of people in the world. You would have saintly paupers and you would have greedy abusers. So Jesus must be talking about something instead of being over here in, in all of your lives and greedy. Don't be like that. He's saying, no, this is the way you should think. Think over on this side of the spectrum. And by the way, he gives us a truism uh, that where our heart is, there will our treasure be. So where, where is our heart today? Is it, is it in the kingdom of God and what's going on through the local church? Is it over in Africa in the, the kingdom work that's being done there? Is it in Central America and the gospel mission work that's being done there? Is it, is it somewhere uh, here in North America where church with bank accounts? Our furnishings? Is it in our, I mean, wh where is our heart? That's the question we have to ask. By the way, too, it, it's not true that your money will, will follow your heart. Your heart follows your money. Don't, the point is feeling to come over us. When I, when I just feel a certain way, then I'll start giving. No, no. We, we know this just from experience that the things that we're committed to, the things that we're involved in with our time, the things that we give our resources to, that's where our hearts are. Those things, it's our to say all the time. It really got his wallet that he got his heart. 
Is Jesus talking here about a salvation by works? No. No, he's talking about what it looks like to truly be redeemed, to truly be saved people. Well, I want to tell you about what we read in the Bible. In a magazine article, this was probably 2011, and the title of the article says, When You Feel Loved, You Love Stuff Less. And so this, this grand psychology study, here's what they found out. Here's, here, here are the findings. Tend to love their material possessions less. The obverse is true, that if someone does not feel loved by others, they tend to really love their material things more and more. And, and so how could we just take that truth that the secular world, that the love that our Heavenly Father has for us. It's not that we won't, we won't like our things. We might even say, I, you know, I really love this thing. But, but if we know God's heart, if we know how much He loves us, those material possessions just pale in certain times in our lives to take this literally and to divest. Kent Hughes tells a story about a, friends of theirs when they were newlyweds, a couple, they, uh, the wife was concerned about the husband. He was, they, they just got married. He was a professor. There just didn't seem to be, he said he was a Christian, but there wasn't anything in his life to indicate that he really felt like it should influence him in any way. In fact, he even stopped going to church altogether. So she started praying hard. She started praying very hard. And to see a whole lot, just a little bit here and there. Well, then one day he came home and he said to her, I've been reading the Bible. I've been reading what the Bible says. And then he read Luke chapter 12, verse 33, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money. And that's when she really started praying. <laughs> and so they, they did it. They basically divested themselves of just about everything. They, they sold just about everything they had. They, they bought a double Mexico. They had ministry to the 60s generation that God used in amazing ways. And Hughes says that if you look at them now, they're, they, they own a home. They're living very conventionally, but, but their life is characterized by constant ministry. To do that, you know, some of us, that's going to be the call on our lives. God is going to call us to be like that couple, to, to sell everything maybe and, and, and to go. Uh, for others, others of us, it's going to be uh, to, to live the Father's heart. We can live this way. That's how we can avoid anxiety and live in the reality of the gospel. Father, thank you that you've given us this opportunity to serve you with all that we have. Lord, be anxious over that. It shouldn't characterize our lives. We know that, and we just want to humbly come before you and just ask that you would forgive us of that, help us to live lives in the reality of the gospel, trusting you, trusting your heart and your care for us, knowing it's your good pleasure to have given us the price of today. Help us to go out and to live this truth in our lives this week. In Christ's name, amen. Well, this is a time in this service where you can respond by, seated, by staying seated where you are, but we want to give you an opportunity. As a couple of our deacons come down here to pray with you, if you want to come forward, have a time of prayer. Ladies, will be a, ladies down here to pray with you, men, some men. If this is something that you want to do, this is a time where you can do that. We want you to feel free to do so. Maybe you have questions about the message today. I'll be around after the service. The invitation never stops. I'd be glad to talk with you. Uh, if you feel like this is it yourself, you follow him in that. Let's stand as we sing.
that it's a scripture course that came right out of the passage that we read this morning. Seek ye first the kingdom of God.